Hello, my name is David O'Kelly and you're welcome to the Capital Ideas podcast. Today I'm speaking with Neil McGowan. Neil is a partner in MML Capital, an Irish private equity fund that invests between 5 and 20 million. Neil, you're very welcome to KPMG. Thanks very much for having me, David. Just to jump right in, can you tell me the types of deals that you want to do? Sure. So as you said, uh, MML is an Irish private equity firm um, established in 2013. Um, we're looking to invest between 5 and 20 million euros of equity in Irish owner-managed businesses, so businesses that are, that are um, uh, oper- operating across the island of Ireland. Uh, we're not a sector-specific investor with that geographic focus, um, uh, but so we're looking really to find interesting businesses with ambitious managers that are looking to grow. Uh, we've spoken about a, a load of deals over the years, and I'm Kind of, I'm interested in that that point, and it would be there with a lot of my, a lot of our clients that you know they do want to take some cash off the table. As an investor, what do you see that does for the business? How does that change the mindset? I think it just primarily it changes risk appetite. Um, increases I mean, or decreases? It increases it. It incre- absolutely increases it. We, I mean, uh, my job is to manage capital on behalf of our investors, and that's a, a, a obviously what I'm trying to do is balance risk and return. But often you come across businesses that have been very successful. Since um, since their establishment, or maybe uh, through some inflection point, but as that store of value grows, often that's the, either all, all of or the very significant majority of the value for the key people involved in the business, and they become a little bit understandably risk averse. You know what I have, mm-hmm. I hold type of attitude, uh, and so they're not making the decision to go into a new market or to launch a new product or to make an acquisition to maximise the potential of the business because they're too concerned about what it may mean. Um, for their own personal personal wealth and, and, and the wealth of their, their family and, and kids and everything else. So we've found in, in lots of cases uh, the opportunity to release some capital um, but to stay materially invested in the business uh, um, frees them up to take decisions that they maybe would, would not have otherwise taken. And it's, it's also not just about the, the capital, it's also having a partner alongside you um, at the board Supporting uh, 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 and helping to, 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 to guide as, as, as best we can in, in making those growth uh, decisions in the business. I'll come back to that word partner because certainly going through your website and so on, partnership comes up a lot. And you know, in, in our dealings, I, I, I would see that too. But I mentioned this that the founder thesis does that mean that you know it tends to be people maybe midway through their career, or you know, do you do deals with people who are maybe later in their career who are looking to transition out of that CEO role? It's a mix, to be honest with you. Like we've we've done deals where people are are, are looking to continue in their current roles. Um, maybe they've taken external capital uh, f- uh, along the journey to help them get to where they where they're at, but haven't taken material amount of money themselves. Want to make a move. Um, the existing capital leader um, is not prepared or doesn't have the bandwidth to follow on, um, but you know they haven't had any kind of liquidity from 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 the business over over many years, um, and as I said, you know uh, we're ha- very happy and understand that that that, that can unlock risk uh, and opportunity for them uh, by giving them some some capital off the table. Now it is a balance if the person is the the key driver in the business. And the person who's effectively we're looking to back going forward, you want to make sure that they're still sufficiently um, incentivized and motivated, and and um, have have sufficient skin in the game. Uh, it's an expression obviously you'd hear a lot in in, in, in private equity language um, to keep driving the business. But you know the concept of freeing up you know somewhat material amount of money for people to enable risk appetite in the business is is, is something we're completely and utterly comfortable with. And that the the partnership. And, and, and how that manifests like you're you're certainly like very successful private equity fund mo- done more deals than any other private equity fund in Ireland uh, and have exited what is it seven or eight deals very successfully but you're not you're not uh, you're, you're sector agnostic so what, being blunt what do you bring to the table then if it's not I can do something in your particular area or uh, help the company in a very specific way I think there's lots of things that we bring. As I said, we're a very partnership-focused investor, so we don't we don't come to the table with an ownership mentality. Um, we're looking to back a plan that uh, the management team have to grow their businesses. You know, our, our average stake size in businesses is around about fifty percent in both our first fund and our second fund, and so whether you're a forty-five or a fifty-five percent shareholder in a business, in our view, doesn't really change the way you interact with it. Um, secondly, I'd say that in terms of what we bring. 
you know, we have a huge amount of experience in um, uh, the, the growing pains, I suppose, that companies go through when, when scaling. Um, and, you know, they may be different from company to company and different from industry to industry. But actually, at their core, a lot of them are the same. You know, there's quite a significant transition that companies go through from being um, very aligned and, and centered around the founder to becoming a company in their own right, effectively a person in their own right, as, as you know, in legal speak, as companies are. Uh, and that's when you start to build material value from being an entity that generates, you know, cash flow on an, a- an annual basis for the owner of the business to something that actually has real and long lasting capital value. I think that transition is 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 uh, um, uh, really important, um, and is, is is something that uh, we we have been through a lot of the time with with our portfolio companies. Does that um, mean broadening the management team? It means broadening the management team. It means thinking about um, sustainability in terms of a lot of companies in Ireland would be, you know, uh, growing up serving multinationals, and they're very very successful and very strong at doing so. But there's, there tends to be some concentration that goes with that, either on, on the customer side or on the supplier side. So helping them diversify away from that. Um, as I said, and, and maybe geographic diversification as well. All those things that enable a company to sustain, to be sustained in the long term. And do you tend to bring outside people onto onto company boards? We do. All MML? Yeah, we do. We do. Um, so we don't have a, a bench of kind of operating people that we kind of parachute into to, to specific circumstances. We try and find individuals that that are relevant and um, uh, that can add to the specific situation. And to be honest with you, have chemistry with both us and the management team. We think the role of a non-exec, um, independent non-exec, is very very important. And um, we have we have those uh, those individuals in all of the companies that we've invested in, and they play a very important role. Um, uh, in, 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 as I said, typically someone who both we and the management team uh, uh, can respect um, and can, I suppose, interface between it, between us and the management team and, and mentor the management team in, in lots of ways as well. Yeah, it sounds uh, it sounds very valuable. Um, and in ter- the so when you're 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 assessing lots of different types of companies, are are there are there characteristics outside of the financial characteristics, but are, are there other characteristics you're looking for in deals? I think, the, I mean, at, at, at risk of labouring the point, the key thing to, is is around the management team, and you know, it, are they uh, uh, people that we can partner with and have the ambition to grow their business? I mean, if you have that, um, I think that that goes a very long way. I mean, most private equity will look for um, similar characteristics in terms of um, businesses that can scale and grow. Um, you know, uh, visibility of revenue and cash flow, all those things that, that, that as you said, the financial metrics. But the key thing for us is uh, aligning and having chemistry and, and a good working relationship with the management team. Um, that goes a very long way in in in, a, in in building a strong investment case for any any business in any industry, actually. And MML is part of there's there's there there are other there are MMLs in other countries. It's a it's a it's a it's an international group. Does does that play a feature in in your investments? How, how it, does that it, work? It, it does and it can. I mean, so MML has been around for thirty odd years, based in London and investing in the UK, um, continental Europe, and in the US. And right. so we we are effectively a sister fund of of, of that organisation, uh, and so that international access in a relatively small group of people. So there are probably less than 50 certainly investment professionals across MML all of whom we know and um, the investments that we we know that they're doing and likewise they know what we're doing and so it's very easy for us to understand where uh, their investment track record can help businesses that we're looking at or where their presence on the ground or, or other investments that they have in their portfolio can benefit the companies that we've invested in as well uh, and as you know most Irish companies grow up looking out and yep. Ireland is a relatively small market and so at a very early stage, probably earlier than than any of the other MML markets, Irish um, entrepreneurs and founders are looking outside Ireland and, and, and into overseas markets. Uh, and, and and we can help very much with that um, through the MML network. Yeah. And you have, you know, whatever, uh, 12, 13, 14 portfolio companies at the moment. Uh, do, the, do those companies work together? Do they, do they interact? They can do. I mean, where it's relevant and where we can facilitate introductions and um, we do so and so we've seen a lot of portfolio companies work together but we don't force it you know yeah. we, you know we, you make an introduction you introduce the ceos to each other or, or the relevant um, commercial people to each other and if it works it works and if it doesn't then you know yeah move on. yeah 
I, I have to pick up on a, a word you mentioned earlier on. You said sustainability, and, and obviously sustainability can be lots of things: it does. Uh, economic, management, people. But the whole the whole ESG agenda as an investor, where, where does that feature on your on your on your thought process? Is it uh, it, it's very high up on the agenda, and obviously has 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 been driven um, there uh, uh, a lot lately. Uh, um, you know, ESG is, is is very much to the fore in in all our discussions, both with our underlying investors and also with our portfolio companies. And I think probably two or three years ago, it, it was a, a conversation more at the LP level, but I think everybody is talking about it now. Um, yeah. Companies get it. Companies are asking us, what are we doing in other portfolio companies? Um, you know, and, and, and we're helping them uh, assess their own um, ESG metrics. So not just environmental, but sustain, sustain, sustainability, and social aspects of their business and, and governance, and also how they can improve you know, and, and, and it's not just about where the companies are now and saying, well, who's, who's top of the league table? It's more about, as I said, the direction of travel and helping them to, to, to understand how they can improve and, 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 and be better in those areas. So the, the LPs, they're the, they're the people you raise funds from uh, to, to then deploy. What, what do you need to do on a, like, what diligence or what, what do you need to do on a deal by deal basis to show, well, we, you know, we start here and we're, we're in a better place after three or five years? Yeah, so we, we will now uh, do external um, uh, specific due diligence around DSG. And as I said, it's, been, it's, it's, it's measuring the base level of the company at the time we invest. Right. Uh, and then we will track those uh, uh, UN sustainability goals primarily over time um, as we, we hold that company in our portfolio and, and look to make improvements in those areas. And it's uh, and that helps the company, it helps them with their own customers, because as I said, a lot of the customers tend to be multinationals and it's an increasingly on the agenda from that side of things as well. Um, it's not just coming from MML and our, and our investment. We got our first term sheet recently from a senior lender um, that, that had ESG related pricing in it mm. um, and that's at the direction of travel un, un, yeah, un, undoubtedly yeah. um, and so it's it, you know it, 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 it all comes back to the same thing you know to, to be able to show and measure and track ESG progress over the, the life of our uh, investment in a business I think is going to be increasingly important for, for the company um, for us as investors uh, and, 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 and will play into our exit as well. And do you see it getting to a point where those deals you won't do for ESG reasons? Um, it's possible, but I mean, I, I, that's not really the purpose of it. As I said, the purpose is to drive progress. I mean, yeah. we, we, we've just um, announced an investment in the logis logistics space, which on the face of it, you could, get, you could say... You get a lot of fuel. Yeah, yeah exactly. And, and, and it, as, it, by necess not by necessity, but as I said, it, it's not about preventing those kinds of transactions. It's about... Um, helping the business um, uh, to to make improvements and, and measure those improvements. Yeah, yeah. Ultimately, if we want to have goods in our shops, we need trucks. To, we do <laughs> <laughs> to do it. It's about can you can you do it more uh, more environmentally in a more environmentally friendly way? And for say for management in companies uh, who who aren't shareholders, uh, what does it mean when a when an MML comes in? So the the, the founder you know, takes cash off the table, de-risks, maybe changes their attitude. What's it mean for the next level, Dan? I think it's a huge opportunity for people across the organizations that we've invested in. Um, typically, when we come across businesses, the ownership is relatively tightly held. You know, there might be a founder, a, a couple of people in, in, in the business and maybe some outside shareholders. But the broader senior management team, which can be anywhere from four to I think in one of our businesses, we've got a group of shareholders at about at, at 13. Right, right. They, they tend uh, to not be um, owners in the business. And that's something that our, our investment can change as a catalyst. And um, so, as I said, w generally, we will create an equity pool um, to enable the next tier of management to become shareholders. Uh, and that massively increases alignment. It, 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 it can mean a very significant change in attitude in terms of being an owner of the business and really empower people. Mm. Um, so, so yeah, it's definitely something in, in all of our businesses we would we, we would do that um, uh, that kind of incentive plan. Well, what's that mean for them on exit? Uh, a, a payday, uh, but it, it can mean a payday. Um, it can mean that they have you know uh, uh, chips at the table at an exit, so they can, can roll those chips into another deal if mm -hmm. it's a secondary buyout into another private equity firm. Uh, and we've seen that. Um, it means it means they have options really at an exit. Um, yeah, yeah. And it, it, like essentially, you've you've probably uh, exited more than any other private equity house in in, in Dublin as well. Um, 
when you when you look back on those exits, and uh, to my knowledge, all have been uh, very successful and, and, and good exits. Were there were there things that happened during the journey that you know you can point to that you know that made a difference over the course of the, the three or five years? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, <clears throat> I mean, no one thing the same, mm. uh, and never uh, according to the world of the spreadsheet. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately. Uh, I might have a bit more hair and a different colour if, <laughs> if, 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 if every investment went uh, exactly to plan. Yeah. But investments are real life. I mean, that's the thing. It's one of the reasons that we we do so much due diligence at the outset. It's not to put the companies through the pain of it all. Yeah. And it is hard work. But it's to make sure that we fully understand the risk that we're taking and that when things do go differently to the plan, because they always do, that we are properly equipped to react uh, as investors. Um but come back to the question, I mean, uh, yeah, there has been a, a, a catalyst for change or catalyst for, for value creation in all of the exits that we've, we've, we, we've had. So uh, most recently, we, we exited our uh, insurance platform, uh, platform in Ovu mm-hmm. uh, to, uh, to AJ Gallagher's, and that was a, a buy and build. So where we invested in an original business, shared an insurance in Wexford in uh, beginning of 2019, the plan was to acquire and, and scale through acquisition in a very fragmented market. Yeah. Uh, and the ability to do that, um, probably in hindsight, not as quickly as we would have liked, but the ability to do that and getting some of those transactions over the line, getting to the point of scale that we could interest a global giant like Gallagher's mm-hmm. in the business was clearly um, the, the catalyst for value creation in that, in that transaction. I mean, Sheridan's, if we had not made any acquisitions, would have been fine. Um, yeah. Insurance broking is a, is a good standalone investment. But to really create value was 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 around the, the scaling through acquisitions. And very hard to get any acquisitions done in that space. It's it's highly yeah, it's, competitive. It's, a lot of it's it's been yeah, it's been it, it yeah, has been one of the most active sectors in in the M and A market probably over the last three years consistently. Yeah. So do, does M and A uh, so buy uh, buying buy and build does that tend to be a theme across companies or no? It's it's one investment theme. It's not the only one. Um, mm-hmm. Uh, international acquisition um, can be another. International expansion can be another. We have another business at the moment in our portfolio that's it's it is already operating outside Ireland, but it's about to make its second geographic expansion into a in, into the US, mm. uh, and we expect that, that to be a game changer for the business. So not not acquisition, an organic greenfield move effectively, um, but that obviously opens up a much bigger marketplace, uh, has much bigger runway for whoever um, is the, is the next owner of the business. Um, and, and 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 that's a key part of of investing is to be able to have a, a growth strategy and a value creation strategy for the next owner of the business because we we know that we are custodians of, of of the business and shareholders of the business for for a limited period of time. Um, and growth and partnership, how how does that sit with you know financial leverage and 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 efficiency? Do you, do you tend to use a lot of debt in deals? Or? No, not at all. I mean, I think uh, debt and growth are two sides of two different sides of, of of investment strategy. To be honest with you, I mean, I think most businesses that are looking to grow quickly and aggressively, um, you know, being being overburdened with debt is not not necessarily a good idea. And we've done. Mm. I would say out of the 18, 19 transactions we've done, we've done three or four with no debt at all. Right. Um, some with a view to using debt for acquisition um, and some because the organic growth opportunity was just in, meant that using using debt and, and, and um, having to, I suppose, manage quarterly repayments, et cetera, like that, um, and covenants, all that goes along with debt it just wasn't appropriate for the business at that time, at that time of its development. On the flip side, obviously, for 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 a, um, a more established business where mm. um, um, uh, M and A may not be the immediate plan, uh, debt is is a useful part of the capital structure, but not to over over leverage. So, um, we will use debt in the right in the right circumstances and to the right level. Uh, and, and in our view, um, there's a there's a right level for each each business, and we tend to err on the side of conservatism because. You know, most of the time we're investing in businesses that may not have ever had a term debt facility, mm. may, not have had, may, not, may never have reported covenants, yeah. um, and you don't want to be pushing pushing that at the very first time. Yeah, yeah, and it turns out we'd see a, a, a lot of deals that have maybe a, a moderate amount of debt initially, and then as people get comfortable, there might be an additional debt to maybe repay some of the additional capital. Uh, yeah, and we've done that a couple of times in our in our transactions. So, um, again bringing in debt to a moderate degree in the initial transaction and then business trades very well um, uh, and, and then you might do a recap- recapitalization, pay back some of our investment, pay back some of the investment of the, the uh, of the management team or, or founder shareholders. Uh, and also we found the banks, you know, 
can be a little bit cautious uh, about a new relationship. But once they've been in the business for a year or two and seen it perform to plan or ahead of plan, then you know they, they really like to, to follow their money effectively. Yeah. And you mentioned, you know, clearly not every deal goes according to the to the spreadsheet. That's that that's life. Other than the black swan events that you couldn't could never forecast, what are the sorts of things that maybe that that create issues along the way? Yeah, I mean, as you said, other than that, I mean, it's it is primarily external driven factors. Right. I mean, you know, one of our investments in in our first fund was the travel department, um, mm. um, a, 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 a business that was founded. By, by an individual who would stepped back from the day-to-day -day running of, the, of it and probably had brought in a manager on a, on a promise effectively to lead an MBO, very, very strong industry leader, 30 years experience. Um, and we plan, you know, and, and also very, very strong customer base with, you know, nearly 70% repeat booking uh, and high cash flow generation in, in that sector. Um, uh, obviously, nobody could foresee a global pandemic, um, which has mm. been extraordinarily difficult for everybody in the travel sector, and particularly the travel department. So that's life, you know. That, 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 that counts you, as an unexpected it does. situation, I think. Yeah, it does. And for us, you kind of you, you work with the, you, you continue to support the business as we have. We've invested into the business since COVID, um, and you continue to support the management team, and you just you, you ride it out. It's part of being an investor. It's part of having a portfolio. Um, means you know you take you have to take the good with the bad across your portfolio and uh, you and, and and the other uh, partner in mml rory quirk you, you effectively set up mml here as a as a startup can you maybe tell me a little bit about that about the culture you tried to build into mml and, and, the, and the approach to investing yeah i mean i think <clears throat> um what we've tried to do in mml was bring in people who a bit like us we now have an investment team of eight hmm. um that we built over 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 the period since 2013 um, and, you know, I, I suppose what we try to do in MML is have an ethos of being as straightforward to deal with as we possibly can be um, and uh, as much as we possibly can do, do what we said we were going to do. So yep. um, we might um, be in contact with yourself at, at, at around a business that you're, you're advising. Um, at some point, we'll be, we'll be making an, an initial offer um, to invest. And as, as best we possibly can, we'll, we will stick to that. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. And that, that, I think... It goes to who we are as people, uh, it goes to the ethos of MML, and it goes to our reputation in the market, which is, in a small market like Ireland, is absolutely critical. Yeah, my experience has always been, uh, in, 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 and I say this in a positive way, I don't promise to agree with you, but I'll tell you my view and yeah. why I've formed that view. Yeah, and, you know, our, our, it's not, we don't have a monopoly on um, uh, business intuition and um, assessments of companies and there are some businesses that we will really like and others that we, we, we may not and that's fine it doesn't mean it's a bad business or a bad investment opportunity it just won't be for us you know and, and our, what we'll try to do is is give that view as quickly as, as possible so we can all move on with our lives you know yeah yeah and your own your own life Neil, you 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 worked as an m a advisor uh, uh similar to similar to me maybe can you give maybe a bit more color on your on your on your career to date and the point up to founding mml in ireland sure <clears throat> so I, I qualified as a chartered accountant long feels feels like a very long time ago um and i uh, at an early stage um probably when the concept of deal teams and transaction services within um, the professional services firms were being formed. It shows how long ago it was. I managed to get involved in a in a transaction at, at due diligence for Guinness, um, All right. uh, or Diageo as it was then. Yeah. Um, uh, and I just found it fascinating, you know, really, really interesting. And so I kind of got the deal bug at a fairly early stage. Um, I was still in, in articles articles at the time. Um, and so at the end of my, my three years in PwC, I took myself off to London um, and worked in HSBC for, for a year and then Bank of America um, after that. Um, and obviously the, the, uh, the London market, you, the volume of transactions that you see mm. was just um, phenomenal. So it was a very, very steep learning curve over there. Um, and uh, also working with such a, a broad range of international cultures was, was, was fascinating. Um, I hadn't really figured out what the plan was after that, and then before I knew it, I'd done five years over there, and so I figured I better get get myself home before um, yeah. uh, before before be that became too difficult. So I managed to land back here in Good Buddy Stockbrokers, Good Buddy Corporate Finance, just in time to witness the dying roars of the Celtic Tiger in, two, in 2006. <laughs> Timing is everything. <laughs> Timing is everything. Yeah, um, and uh, that was that was a very interesting experience. Uh, I, I, in Good Buddy, I was doing um, deal advisory, but we were also doing some. Um, kind of quasi principal investing with our private client network right um yeah and so we one, one transaction in particular stands out where 
we we um, put together a deal to buy the tower network from from Aircom. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, and acting as principal and then s- underwriting the debt and equity debt mm-hmm. through AB equity through good bodies and then selling it into the private client network. Yep. So I, again, that was probably the, the taste for principal investing. Um, and so I, from good body, then I joined FL Partners. So the, the, the boutique um, investment house set up by um, Neil Hughes and Peter Crowley. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, more, more, more investing there with um, kind of high net, worth, high net worth individuals transacting on a deal by deal basis. And that was, I suppose, a, a mirror of what was going on in Ireland at the time. There, yeah. there wasn't a huge amount of committed institutional capital for later stage companies, curiously. Um, and so when the opportunity came um, with MML to join a business like that, I thought it was a phenomenal opportunity. And, and, and the right, at the right time in my career, right time from, from FL perspective. And as I said, you know, it, it's about time that there has been that, the, that funding available to Irish SMEs. Uh, it's, it's definitely one of the silver linings of the very dark clouds of the financial crisis that we now have a very active uh, and positive private equity community. Uh, There is, and I think a lot of credit has to go to the organs of the state, if you like, Mm -hmm. for that, Enterprise Ireland in particular, and and, and ISA for for, for setting that up. I think the challenge now is for the private sector to take that on. Um, And one of the focuses that we as a a sector have through the IVCA is to try and encourage more more private institutional investment in private capital, if that's not too much of 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 a tongue twister. Both private debt, private equity, and venture capital. Yeah, yeah. No, we're we're, we're certainly in a we're in a much better place than we were. It, it, it is really very encouraging. And the, the the question everyone hates getting asked, you know, o- over that over that time period, is is there a, is there a favorite deal? Is there is there one that really made a mark on you? In you terms did tell of me you were going to ask career? this question, but uh, I'll, 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 given that it feels like we're in a TV studio, I'll give a politician's answer. <laughs> I mean, it is very hard. You know, yeah, you're course. tempting you're tempted yeah. to say the one that, w- that that generated the highest return. Yeah. But uh, you know, every every deal is 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 an individual has an individual life of its own. It's like almost like you know, who's your favorite child? Effectively, yeah, you yeah, hundred uh, percent. And and so, and you don't want to upset anybody. And at the same time, every transaction had its own twists and characteristics and everything else. So. You know, uh, when I was in FL, we made a majority investment in Sunseeker International, which was a luxury yacht, yacht manufacturer. Um, I can see the upside there, yeah. yeah. <laughs> which is a talking point, and it was certainly very high profile, and it, it was a probably quasi turnaround. And I do remember when we were out raising the, the, the um, MML Ireland Fund One, people were asking about our investment track record, and I was talking about Sunseeker, and I think there was a, a mixture of, of uh, interest and fear on the face of the people we were talking yeah, to. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it, under MML, I mean, as I said, we've uh, we've we've been lucky enough to work with some phenomenal uh, managers mm-hmm. and owners of businesses. Um, uh, you know, uh, some that followed the, the plan, followed the the, the spreadsheet, um, and others that w- we just made it work collectively uh, between us and, and and the management teams, and, and did a, did a very good job. So I, I'm probably going to kick the touch on that question. Yeah, <laughs> look, I, I, and to be honest, uh, uh, I think the politician's answer is entirely appropriate. Like, you know, for, for a fairly long career myself, like every deal typically has something remarkable about, uh, about it. You it know, does. There's always unique features. And, and, I, and I think the key thing that we understand, and like it's intensely personal, you know, yeah. and probably more so here, I say this to my UK colleagues than in the UK, we're always, almost always the first time institutional investor, almost always you know the vast majority of the store of value in the individuals and so i said earlier on about trying to be straightforward to deal with and doing what you say the, the re- there's a couple of reasons for that one we're not that sophisticated and we you know we we, we try, you know for ourselves our own sanity <coughs> to do that but also the responsibility to the people your 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 counterparty in the deal it's so personal to them <clears throat> it's their store of value it's their family it's their the name above the door a lot of the time yeah um, and so uh, that's that, that, that you know. I, I think often people don't realise just how 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 emotionally in, involving it is, and there's a lot of work involved in a deal. But just it, it's it is it is intensely personal. It is intensely personal, and I mean, we've had situations where we've signed a deal at eleven thirty at night, gone to try and find somewhere where there is to drink, and then there's to have a, a drink to celebrate the transaction, and it's just been a release. Yeah, you yeah, know, like a, yeah. a, a valve yeah. released by. By the individuals you're 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 you're, you're transacting yeah. with, you know. We almost feel like clients have like Stockholm syndrome that the week after the deal they don't have the weekly project co- project yeah. management call or, yeah. or, or whatever else. Yeah. But yeah. Are, are there tips you'd give to you know people who are starting on that road who are, who are starting to think about I, I taking think, on private equity? I, yeah, I think so. I mean, I think the first thing um, is 
to remember that plan A is keep doing what you're doing, keep running the business. You know, if you're talking to someone like me and you're three or four months into a fairly intense transaction and you come to a, a month end reporting and there's some underperformance in the business mm. uh, because you've taken your eye off the ball, uh, people like me are going to go, what's going on with your tra- your trajectory? Where's the trend going? Yeah. Questions that you, you shouldn't, that are unnecessary, I suppose. Yeah. So stick to the day job or make sure that you have a team in place that means you can do both to you know dedicate the right resources to the transaction yeah but keep the, keep the show on the road that's the most important thing yeah you know once you're trying to explain performance you're it, it's, a, it's a bad place to be at the very yeah. least it's going to be a delay uh it, it's having that dedicated deal team it's not an infomercial whether it's internal or external or whatever well, but i mean i think the other just thing recognizing it's a big job it is a big job to do it. it is a big job i mean um the next thing i would say is be prepared you know the little scout motto whatever it is you know and that means having an internal and external team um, mm. uh, 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 that recognizes the scope of what you're trying to do and as you say transactions are intense for everybody for us they're intense and this is our day job mm. um, for 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 the owners and managers of the business they're intense emotionally and, and and from a workload perspective and they have a day job to be doing as well and so definitely uh, uh, get the right team in place internally and externally Use a corporate finance advisor. Use a law firm um, uh, uh, that have been involved in the types of such transactions that you're looking to do before. Um, uh, and I would say, when choosing those advisors, try to choose someone that you know and trust, mm. if that's possible already, rather than. Um, I'm not just saying this because you're here, rather than going for the the most economic option. Yeah, yeah. I was, I was gonna. I was holding off asking you to name people you'd recommend. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I agree. But it's, the it's, chemistry is really important. Chemistry is. It's chemistry is very important, and communication throughout a transaction is very important. But I think you know there will be things in a transaction that, as a management team, as the owner of a business, that you question and maybe you won't particularly like. Yeah. And having someone with a trusted relationship enough to be able to tell you actually. That's normal. Don't mm. worry about it because I've seen this a hundred times. This is the way it works out. Or actually, uh, they're, they're they're outside market. There we can do better here. You can do yeah, better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Absolutely. And, and having that someone that is able to give you that advice and that you listen to it is critical. Neil, I've, I've really enjoyed the question. I'm, go- I'm going to ask you a final one. Why do you think companies should take on private equity? What impact does it have? Well, I don't think private equity is for every company. Mm-hmm. To be honest with you, um, I think. I think sitting down with your advisor and and your family and the mirror probably at the outset of embarking on any transaction to determine what you want to get out of it is critical, is very very important. And I think for businesses that are looking to grow, um, possibly where there's some shareholders liquidity required, either for the for yourself, for the owner manager, or for other people on the share register, if there's a succession issue, um, if M and A is potentially on the on the agenda. Um, all of those things lend themselves to private equity, particularly if either there isn't an ability to or isn't a desire to sell the business to a trade player. We've, we've got involved in a lot of situations mm-hmm. where those things were the case, where there was a succession um, um, plan um, or lack of a succession plan, but it either wasn't appropriate or the, 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 counter, the, the principals didn't want to sell the business outright. That's where private equity really comes into its own. Neil McGowan from MML Capital. You've been a great guest. Thank you very much. Thanks, David.